All right, here we go. Um, yes, good morning. Um, I won't keep you too long. I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions, so please be, be thinking about questions. Um, I'm, it's a great pleasure to be the first speaker of the conference. It's quite an honor. You're going to be hearing about a lot of very exciting things during the next couple of days. So I need to kind of set the stage and talk about exciting things. So here we go. Let's go. Let's talk about exciting things. Economics. <laughs> there are competing theories of economics, uh, how to structure an economy. One of those theories would be uh, capitalism. Uh, in capitalism, you basically, the idea is that the market regulates uh, the, the economy through competition. It involves some kind of invisible hand. I don't know, there's a lot of supernatural stuff involved in capitalism, it seems. And the theory is that the, a good, healthy amount of competition leads to a bell curve distribution of wealth and resources. Um, you, you'll often see these bell curve distributions when it comes to things like... Um, uh, height or weight or IQ, right, where some people have more, some people have less, but the disparity between the two is generally not that great. Now, an economy could follow a bell curve distribution where some people have more, some people have less, but the disparity isn't great. The problem arises when the market isn't a level playing field. And when that happens, you get a distribution much more like this. This is a power law distribution where the people who have uh, a lot of something have a real lot more of something than the, the long tail of poverty down here. So you get the 1% with all the wealth and this long tail of, of, of poverty. And what you tends to happen is in that 1%, that you've got a few uh, players who are absolutely dominating the market, right? They're too big to fail as we say. Um, so this tends to be the, the problem with capitalism is that it sounds great in theory, but it's not so good in practice. Now, I happen to think that competition is a good thing. And if capitalism were regulated, it would work very well. Um, the reason why I think competition is a good thing is that what we don't want to get to is this monopoly situation where you know just one or two players are dominating a market. And the reason I say that is because on the web, We've seen what happens when we get into a monopoly situation. Uh, and this happened in the 90s in the browser market. Uh, I know I'm showing my age talking about the browser market in the 90s, but if you were there, man, right, the struggle is real. Um, we saw what happened when Internet Explorer uh, reached over 90% market share of browsers, and it led to this, this uh, uh, power law distribution of market share. I mean, Firefox was a direct response to this monopoly situation with uh, Microsoft and Internet Explorer. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that the more browsers there are, the better. I know it can seem as a developer what you actually, you think you want just one browser, you think you want just one rendering engine, but trust me, you don't. It's a bad situation when there's no competition. Um, so, so I guess I'm in favor of capitalism because I like competition and healthy markets. Who knew? Um, but we, we dodged a bullet here. We dodged a bullet in the 90s when we could have ended up with this monopolistic situation where there was literally only one browser. And uh, now we have many browsers, not as many as I'd like, to be fair. Um, and we must, I think, be vigilant that we don't end up in the same situation where one browser is dominating the market. And we managed to dodge the bullet in the 90s because the web kind of interpreted this monopolistic situation with Microsoft Internet Explorer, it interpreted that situation as damage and rooted around that, that damage. Like I said, Firefox, for example, was a direct response. Now, this idea of uh, interpreting something as damage and, and rooting around it, that's a term from network architecture. Um, like economies, there are many different theories on how you might structure a network. Uh, the classic model is hub and spoke where you have a very central sort of hub and lots of smaller nodes connected to it. So this would be how you know, telegraph stations used to work or telephone switchboards. It's kind of the way airports still work, where you have you know, a few big, big airports and then lots of smaller regional airports that connect to the big ones. And the hub and spoke model uh, works great. It's a, it's a very efficient way of working until you take out the hub. 
And then what you're left with is these, these nodes that, have, that are not connected in any way. So it's got this kind of single point of failure in that centralized hub. Now, that single point of failure, that was the direct stimulus that started the work at ARPA that resulted in the ARPANET. This is back in the 60s. And the ARPANET later led to the internet. It was directly trying to avoid that single point of failure, specifically in communication networks. So what you could do is have this distributed network architecture where all the nodes are, are connected in some way. There's no, this is, this is more like a bell curve distribution of nodes. There isn't a big monopolistic player. Uh, every node has some connections, some more than others, but you know, the, dis the, the disparity isn't that great. This is a distributed network. And now if you were to take out one of the nodes, the network would continue to work. It wouldn't work as well as it was before you took out the node, but it continues to work. So you don't have that single point of failure, right? You can root around the damage. So like I said, this was uh, the idea of this, along with packet switching, was, you know, the, the idea was to, to, to combat that single point of failure that was in uh, command and control structures. This was in the military in the 1960s. You probably heard, right, that the internet was designed to withstand nuclear attack. It's not exactly true, but it, it, the impetus for this network architecture was that um, you wouldn't suffer from that hub and spoke single point of failure. Um, now, we tend to talk about this, about the military past of the internet and the ARPANET before it, as though somehow the internet has blood on its hands because it comes from this military background. But actually the motivation behind having this kind of network architecture was not to give an upper hand in the case of nuclear war, but to try to avoid nuclear war. Because if you think about it, if both sides have the hub and spoke model, both sides have a communication network that suffers from a single point of failure, then if there's even the possibility that the other side might take out your hub, you're more likely to make a first strike to take out their hub. But once you have a more resilient network architecture in place, it reduces the chance of a first strike. Uh, in fact, the creators of the ARPANET were in favor of sharing this technology with the Russians so that the chance of nuclear war would go down, not increase. Now this architecture of uh, a distributed network where there's no plan to it whatsoever, and nodes just make connections to other nodes without any kind of planning or forethought, that's the same kind of architecture that ended up being used by the World Wide Web, which sits on top of the internet, right? You've got the internet, the bottom layer, with TCP, IP, all that stuff, and then all these different protocols on top. And one of those protocols is HTTP. So we've got the same architecture on the web as we do on the internet, this distribu distributed network, where uh, every URL is more or less equal, right? Uh, some URLs have more links than others, but there's nothing in the structure of the web that privileges one URL over another URL. And that means the web is this wild, sprawling, chaotic mess, but it works because of its distributed nature. Now, interestingly, in the early days of the web, it had, it had competition from other kinds of networks. Um, things like CompuServe and AOL. I know we think of AOL now as maybe a, like a website, but it was literally a separate kind of network. And these were kind of like these walled gardens. These were safer, more planned spaces compared to the World Wide Web. And they were trying to compete with the World Wide Web uh, on that basis by saying, like, well, don't go out into the wild, lawless, you know, unkempt World Wide Web, stay within the safe confines of AOL or CompuServe. And they would generate lots of interesting content to try and keep people within those walled gardens. They were gated communities with pre-made content. And yet they lost. They couldn't compete with the wild, lawless nature of the World Wide Web. The web won. Right? People decided we wanted the sprawling, chaotic mess of the web, and we didn't want these safe, walled gardens with pre-made content. So the web won, right? And yet, years later, we returned to the safety of walled gardens, centralized hubs like Facebook and Twitter and Medium. So these are kind of the modern equivalent of CompuServe and AOL, but with one difference. Whereas CompuServe and AOL had staff on hand working tirelessly to create engaging content to keep people in, 
we create the content for Facebook, Medium, Twitter, and these walled gardens. How did it come to that? We're creating the content for them. Like, Facebook is probably the biggest media company in the world, and it doesn't produce any media. We do that for Facebook. So why? Why did we return to these walled gardens? Well, a simple explanation is to do with Metcalfe's law, right? The fact that everyone is already on Facebook. The reason why everyone is on Facebook is because everyone is on Facebook. You know Metcalfe's law, right? The idea that, uh, what is it, the power of a network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users. Basically, that the more people are using something, the better is how I read Metcalfe's law. So, you know, the first person who had a fax machine had a completely useless thing. But then as soon as one other person had a fax machine, it was exponentially more useful, and so on. Um, so, yeah, uh, Facebook, it works because everyone's on Facebook. There's nothing intrinsically um, good or better about it. Now, what that means is we've kind of returned to a single point of failure. Um, in security terms, we talk about things having a large attack vector. Well, because everyone is on Facebook, that makes it a large attack vector. Let's say, I don't know, I'll pick a random example. Let's say you're a Russian hacker trying to destabilize Western democracy. Well, in the past, you would have had to take out a lot of different news outlets, you know, wherever people were getting their news. But now that we have a centralized hub, you just have to attack one place. It's kind of like, you know, people always have to keep their WordPress installations patched because of security vulnerabilities. It's not that WordPress is any more or less secure than other content management systems. It's just really popular, and that makes it a target. Same here. Uh, it's a large attack vector. So why? why wh how did Facebook end up with everybody on Facebook? Pretty simple answer is um, it's convenient. Right? If you wanted to set up your own website, that's a lot of hassle, right? Getting a, getting a domain name, getting a server. Uh, there's, there's friction involved. So the easier path is to publish something on uh, one of these walled gardens like Facebook or Medium or Twitter, right? It, the barrier to entry is really low. It's, it's very convenient. The cost is that you give up some control there. You're, you're giving power over to the publisher who is no longer you. It's Facebook or Medium or Twitter. And they decide who's going to see what you publish on their platform using some kind of magic algorithm. They now have control over the hyperlinks on the web. So there's this uh, idea that maybe we could get a balance between these two things. Maybe it'd be possible to have the convenience, the user experience of using something like Facebook or Medium or Twitter, and yet still have control over what we publish on the web. And that's the basic idea behind this movement called the indie web. Um, the, the, I mean, the basic idea is this, that you should have your own website, which seems like a fairly incontroversial uncontroversial idea, uh, it certainly would have been uncontroversial in the past, these days it seems downright disruptive to suggest you could have your own website. Can I get a show of hands? Who here has their own website? Great. All right. Fantastic. Uh, I also have my own website. Um, it's, I'd say it's one of my prized possessions, even though it's not a physical thing. I just love publishing on my own website for various reasons. Um, the, having control over my own data is one of them. Um, one of the other reasons is to do with longevity. I also want to have control over how long something is, is online. Um, you know, if you ever published uh, on, for example, MySpace, uh, sorry, it's gone. See also GeoCities, Delicious, Magnolia, Pounce, Doppler. I could go on. Right? You hand it over control to these other places, so you can't really complain when they disappear. So I'm, I'm interested in how long something stays online. I want to have control over that. And I'm not saying that you know, everything you publish should stay online forever. What I'm saying is that you should have that choice. You should be the one to decide how long something you publish stays online. It's tough, though, because link rot seems to be inevitable on the web. It's partly down to that architecture of the web. When Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Caillou, the kind of co-creators of the web at, at CERN, when they created the web, they were trying to encourage people, mostly uh, higher level education, to use 
the World Wide Web. And they submitted a proposal to a hypertext conference, because hypertext has existed longer than the web. So they submitted a paper about this newfangled World Wide Web thing to this hypertext conference in the early 90s. And the paper was rejected, rejected with extreme prejudice, because they said, no, this World Wide Web thing was far too simple. It would never work. They explained that any decent hypertext system has two-way linking. That is, there's an awareness at both ends of the link. So what that means is if the thing you're linking to happens to move, right, a linked resource moves, then the link remains intact. So this is actually a great system in theory, but it's necessarily complex to implement it in practice. Now on the web, we have one-way linking. I link to something. I don't need to ask for anyone's permission to do that, one of the great things about the web. But also, unfortunately, that means if that thing moves or goes away, I'm stuck with a broken link, link rot, 404, right? Um, so that's a bit of a shame that the, the World Wide Web has this uh, simple architecture, which is really powerful, but it kind of tends to lead to link rot, except there's a clever technique that if you, if you kind of squint at it just right, sort of looks like two-way linking on the web. And it's made possible using a very humble little building block in HTML, the rel attribute. And you've probably seen the rel attribute before on the link element. Rel is short for relationship. And the value in the link element excuse me, describes the relationship of the linked document to the current document. So I'm sure you've all seen this, right? In the head of your HTML, you say link rel equals style sheet. You're saying the linked document, whatever's inside the href, has the relationship of being a style sheet for the current document. Now, you can use it on the A element as well as the link element. So, for example, you can say pre. The linked document has the relationship of being the previous document to the current one. Or next. The linked document has the relationship of being the next document. This is very handy for things like pagination in search results. So there's a, there's a handful of these rel values um, that are actually in the HTML spec, and you can add your own rel values as well. Now, there's a rel value that on the face of it seems extremely silly. And that's rel equals me. The linked document has the relationship of being me. Seems kind of odd. Here's how I use it. When I link from my website to a profile on one of these walled gardens, like let's say Twitter, I'll say rel equals me. That URL on Twitter, that has the relationship of being me. And that's me on Flickr. And that's me on GitHub. OK, fine, but all three of these are still just regular one-way links, no different to any other links on the web, right? But if you go to Twitter or Flickr or GitHub and you look at my profile there, one of the things you can do when you sign up for these services is add a link back to your home page. And they link back to it also using rel equals me. So from my Twitter profile or my Flickr profile or my GitHub profile, there's a link saying adactio.com, my website, has a relationship of being me. So now there's a two-way connection. There's this, this kind of claimed authorship for both. I claim from my website to have ownership over that profile and that profile and that profile. And on each of those profiles, they claim to have ownership over my website. All right, so what can we do with this? Well, we can do authentication. Uh, each one of those services, Twitter, Flickr, GitHub, they all offer authentication through OAuth. Now, uh, OAuth, very cool, but way over my head. Like, I do not have the smarts to implement OAuth on my website. I don't want the hassle of becoming an OAuth provider. But thanks to these mutual rel me links, I don't need to offer OAuth. I can just piggyback on the authentication that's provided by those services. And this is something called rel me auth. 
So here's an example of it in action with a service called IndieAuth, where I literally log in with my own website. I give it my website, it then scours for these rel me links, finds them, and I choose who I want to authenticate with. So in this case, I'll choose Twitter, do the OAuth dance, and I've authenticated. All possible because of a few small attributes like rel equals me. Now, why would I want to authenticate my own website? Well, authentication is one part of building an API. If you want to build a read-write API. And now with authentication taken care of, I didn't have to do that. I'm just going to piggyback on the OAuth provided by other services. I can use a different standard called Micropub to handle incoming post requests. Now, this, this is a, a, an endpoint for an API. So it is more complicated than simply adding rel equals me to a couple of hyperlinks. Um, but it's a server-side technology, so you can write it in whatever language you're comfortable with. But once that endpoint exists to handle uh, post requests that have been authenticated, then I can publish to my own website using somebody else's interface. So here I'm authenticating with uh, rel me auth, and then I'm posting some content using somebody else's form to create post on my own website. And that's possible because of this micropub endpoint. Now that particular example there was using a, a service called Quill. Uh, and Quill was created by Aaron Parecki, who builds a lot of nice tools for this indie web stuff. Uh, and he's also built some kind of bridging tools. He's built one called Own Your Gram and Own Your Swarm. Because I like using these services like Instagram and Swarm, right? You know, these native apps on my phone. But these services do not offer micropub support by default. So this is what Own Your Gram and Own Your Swarm is about. I authenticate with these services, and then whenever I use Instagram or Swarm, I can send that request to my micropub endpoint on my own site. So for example, whenever I post something to Swarm, a copy gets sent to my website. And whenever I post something to Instagram, it gets sent to my website. So effectively, I'm using these uh, nicely designed uh, interfaces on these native apps as a posting interface to my own website. Again, I'm sort of piggybacking on all the work that these services do, right? All the designers who put all that effort into making Instagram work smoothly, I'm using that to post to my own website. So there's a, a terrible acronym for this approach where I'm using another service to post to my own website, and that is PESOS. Publish elsewhere and syndicate to your own site. Now, there's an alternative to Pesos, which is Posse. Publish on your own site and syndicate elsewhere. And this is what I tend to prefer, right? Where the canonical version, it begins on my website, and then I give copies to these other services, these silos. Now, this isn't always an option, because some of those services really are like roach motels, right? Instagram doesn't allow you to post to it in any other way other than through its app. Like that's, there's no way of doing it through the API. But you can syndicate to Medium and Twitter and Flickr. You used to be able to syndicate to Facebook. They're cracking down on that. It's becoming more of a roach motel over time. So the point is this way you get to benefit from the reach of all these services. Right? When I ask people, why are you publishing on Medium instead of on your own website? Why are you publishing on LinkedIn or Facebook instead of your own website? They always talk about the reach. Well, what if you could have both? What if you could publish on your website and syndicate it out to other places? So in my own site, I've got this interface for posting short updates, little notes of less than, say, 280 characters. I publish to my own website, but I have these options I've given myself to publish to Twitter and Flickr. In fact, I, why, don't we, why don't we do that right now? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to send a photo to my website. Okay, everybody, wave. Yay. Okay, thank you. I'll use that photo. Now I'm going to type into my little things. Uh, uh, talking about the indie web. 
exclamation point. And I'm going to leave these uh, toggles open so that it will send a copy to Twitter and send a copy to Flickr. Now we see how good the internet connection is in here. Oh, it's going to take a while. We'll come back to that. Well, in, in the uh, best tradition of uh, tel television chefs, here's one I made earlier. Um, here's an example of a post on my website of a very good dog called Huxley. And when I post this to my website, a copy gets sent to Flickr. And a copy gets sent to Facebook. But like I said, they're kind of cracking down on that now. Um, and a copy appears on Twitter. So the canonical version, the canonical URL is my website, and all of these other places are copies. And now I'm reaching the audience of these other places. Aha, you say, but what if people start commenting or liking or sharing that copy rather than commenting or sharing or liking the original? Well, no problem. If someone you know, posts some comments on Twitter, I receive those on my own website. They get sent back. And this is made possible thanks to another building block called WebMention. WebMention accepts just very simple pings, something saying, hey, I've linked to you. Right? So let's say you link to a URL on my website, straightforward one-way link. I have no way of knowing that you've linked to my site. So you send a ping to my web mention endpoint. That's all it does is just accept pings, accepts uh, things going, hey, hey, I link to you, hey, right? And now it's up to me what I do with that information. I can display it on my site as a comment or whatever. Um, now, the web mention, again, is like Micropub. It's an endpoint that sits uh, potentially on your server, but you can actually delegate it to third parties. Uh, I guess this is kind of like the, the serverless approach is uh, use a web mention endpoint from somewhere else. This is one of them, web mention IO. Um, very useful if you're using you know, a static site generator for your website where maybe you, you want to have lots of different third-party services to handle all this. So this is kind of like an answering service for web mentions. You check in at the end of the day and say, any web mentions for me today? Uh, very useful. Um, the other thing that's really useful is a service called Bridgy, which acts like a translation service. In the same way that uh, Own Your Gram and Own Your Swarm translated posts from Instagram and Swarm into posts on my website, Bridgy translates uh, comments and likes and retweets and shares uh, into web mentions, into those pings. Because you know, Twitter does not support web mention by default, and um, Facebook doesn't support web mentions by default. But you authenticate with Bridgie using that rel me auth, so all you have to do is add those rel equals me links to your site. And then it sort of monitors your accounts on these other services. All the accounts that you'd link to with rel equals me, it's, it just keeps an eye on those accounts. It's polling. And any time there's a response to a copy of something on that site, uh, you get notified of that. And then, like I said, it's up to you what you do with that. Um, so I just show them in a fairly boring manner, just display them on my site as, hey, you know, this is what people responded with. This is what's been shared. These are the likes. Um, kind of dull. Um, Drew McClellan has this kind of nice interface for it. It's got this kind of face pile you know, showing all the, the people who've responded, which is nice. Uh, Drew, along with Rachel Andrew, is one of the people behind a content management system called Perch. And Perch has a lot of this indie web technology built in, the web mentions and the micropub. And that's true of a lot of content management systems. Um, there's plugins for WordPress and Drupal and Jekyll and uh, all kinds of things, which is kind of nice. It means you don't have to start from scratch, right? You don't have to make all this stuff yourself. Uh, there's a lot of open source tools out there that you can use. So Bridgie automatically converts the responses from Twitter, and Facebook, and Instagram into structured data. And the structured data uh, is in the form of microformats. And it's a pretty good idea that you should also structure your own data in some kind of structured way so that when you ping out to other places, you make a response to a post on somebody else's site that they have a way of parsing uh, your pages, right? You send a ping, a web mention to somebody else's site, they can parse your page uh, by looking for microformats. And microformats are probably the simplest way of structuring data on the web because you just take your existing HTML 
and sprinkle a few class attributes into it. Um, so if I'm publishing an article, uh, I'll just add a few extra class attributes to turn it into an H entry, which is one of the microformats. So now if I'm responding to someone else's, they can, they can parse this page and they can see that which part of the page is the article part, which is the page, the bit they should be paying attention to. Um, so you can use class attributes for things other than CSS, by the way. If you check the spec, the class attribute is for general proce purpose processing by user agents. Likewise, if I'm publishing some information about myself, which is a very common thing to do on a personal web page, I can throw in a smattering of class attributes to turn that into an H card, kind of the uh, HTML equivalent of a contact card. So now if I send a, a ping to another website, uh, they know, well, who is this? Who is this person? What's their name? What's their photograph? They know which bits to, to pay attention to. Um, so if you're interested in getting started with this stuff, um, like I said, the first step is just having your own website. And very pleased to see that some of you already have your own websites. Uh, and then you can start doing the simple stuff like adding rel me links to existing profiles, marking up your contact details with H card, marking up your uh, notes and articles and blog posts with H entry microformats. There's this cute website, Indie Webify Me, where you can um, you kind of, it's kind of gamified the idea of getting onto the indie web where there's different levels. Start with having your own domain, then you're publishing content, then you're marking up that content in micro formats, then you get web mentions, then you get micropub, right? It's kind of, it's kind of fun and kind of silly. Uh, the other thing you can do is come along to indie web camps. This is where we kind of get together in real life and uh, spend some time working on this stuff. Uh, they're really fun and really productive. They have a really good structure, which is it's two days. And on the first day, we kind of have a bar camp unconference type thing where we discuss things, you know, the schedule just comes together somehow and we discuss anything to do with publishing on the web. Uh, and then the second day is doing stuff, designing, building, right, getting down to, to brass tacks. And that's, a, that's really good because you tend to get really fired up on the first day and then get a lot done on the second day. So we just had one in Berlin uh, and that was really, really fun. Uh, indie web camps are good. So, that's the indie web with a few building blocks, RELME, Micropub, Web Mention, and Microformats. You get to have control over your own data and still take advantage of Metcalfe's law, get all the benefits of the big social networks. But I do want to say that things like RELME Auth and Micropub and Web Mention and Microformats, they're just technologies. And the technologies aren't what matter. Right? The real building blocks of the indie web can be found uh, at the design principles for the indie web. Um, there's some good design principles there, like you know, focus on the user experience first, make tools for yourself. Um, but most importantly, and I think my favorite design principle, is this, to have fun. And yes, the emoji is part of the design principle. Um, to try and remember, you know, the web can still be this wild and wonderful place. And that your website is your playground, right? You're going to hear about a lot of cool technologies over the next couple of days. And maybe you're not going to get the chance to try them out on client work or, you know, the, the product company you work at. But you get to mess around with the latest and greatest stuff on your own website. You know, you feel like dabbling in CSS Grid or Service Workers or the latest browser API. Well, having a playground where you could have fun, uh, that, that really counts for a lot. And also, it's a place for you to share what you learn. You're going to learn a lot over the next couple of days. And, you know, the original motto of the World Wide Web was, let's share what we know. And you could choose to share what you know on Mark Zuckerberg's website. Or you could choose to share what you know on Ev Williams's website. Or you could choose to share what you know on Jack Dorsey's website. But I hope that you will choose to share what you know on your own website. Thank you very much. If Kari Stone. And now we have time for questions. Jeremy, would you like to take some questions from the I would, audience? I would love to take some questions. I really hope people have questions. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Well, I will. Well, I'll see if that uh, Jeremy, you spoke earlier about uh, GeoCities and uh, a MySpace, that they, they're gone. Do you see a life expectancy for, for Zuckerberg? Uh, no. Uh, over a over long enough lifespan, all you know, websites are doomed. Um, and it's particularly tricky with something like uh, Facebook, where the content is all behind some kind of authentication layer, where you have to log in to see the content. Um, the Internet Archive is doing a great job of crawling the web and storing backups of publicly available uh, URLs. But most of the stuff on Facebook is not publicly available. So when Facebook goes, that's it. Um, it's going to go. Now, this must sound ridiculous for me to talk about a day when Facebook is gone. But trust me, it, a few years ago, it would have been ridiculous for me to talk about a day when MySpace was no longer available. Like, that was inconceivable. MySpace was going to be around forever. But when you're tied to a business model that's around short-term gains and is effectively a Ponzi scheme for advertisers, then, yeah, no, it's, it's going to disappear. And if someone wants to place a bet uh, on that, uh, I'd be happy to take it because um, I actually already have a long-term bet going to do with um, the life expectancy of URLs. There's a service called longbets.org. Um, this bet will run out in 2022. I'm hoping to lose it. I'm hoping that this URL st will still be available in 2022. But this is an 11-year long bet I'm running about the longevity of URLs. Uh, I think about the longevity of URLs a lot. Uh, I could talk for a long time about that. Um, fundamentally, uh, have owning your own data is, is the central part. I won't go down a rabbit hole of all the other parts that are involved in, in ensuring long-term preservation. I will say formats come into it, and I would bet on HTML over a lot of other formats. Um, I'll leave it at that when it comes to longevity. Let's see if that picture showed up. Ah, oh, the picture hasn't come through. Come on. All right, we'll keep waiting for it. Does that we, answer your question? We, we, yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, come on, guys. Thank you. I was wondering if there's a way to kind of control the web mention. Hey, yeah, because, um, well, I see two issues with that. The first one is like, don't be evil, but we know that some people might be. So do you really want to post on your website everything that en anyone is talking about here on so social network? And then we have SEO people, like, will they use that to post backlinks on our website and stuff like that? Or even worse, like spams or scams and stuff like that. So the question is, do you have kind of a way to say, I want only this kind of things or? So um, great questions. I'll, I'll take the second one first, which is about spam. Um, the way we've been considering the spam question when it comes to web mentions is it would be an indicator of success when we start to get spam because then we know something's working, right? Um, for someone to spam, they would have to genuinely have a link to your site. So it is possible to do it, but they kind of have to go to some trouble. Uh, but it isn't that different. If you remember, uh, was it trackbacks was the, the old way? Web mentions are effectively doing the same as trackbacks, but just at a much simpler level, where trackbacks you had required like XML, RPC, complicated stuff. This is literally a post request ping. Hey, I claim to be linking to your site. You then have to check, is there really a link to my site from this URL? Um, but it's, it's entirely possible that spammers could use this as a vector. They would have to go to some effort. Uh, I have seen examples of it, and I'm almost impressed that they went to the effort of you know, spamming via web mentions, because that's, that's, that, that takes the work. So spam's an issue, but kind of separate to that technology. And that's the kind of stuff we would discuss at an indie webcam. It's like, so if spam starts to become an issue, how will we deal with that? Now, your first part is a really interesting question, because this came up at uh, Indie Webcamp Berlin. Um, there was an attendee, Sebastian, from Germany, who's like big into GDPR and privacy, and he's like, OK, when you cho choose to publish a response you received from somebody else on your website, are you now a data controller? Are you a data processor? Um, you know, did that person give consent to have something republished? You know, on the web, we do not require permission to link but do you require permission to um, republish something? And the answer there is, well, it depends, right? In different countries, there's different laws. In the US, you've got the idea of fair use. In the UK, it's fair dealing. So you could say, well, like, if I 
post an extract, an excerpt, that falls under fair use and fair dealing. But that's not really the question because that's around legal obligations. What, you know, what, what, what are you legally required or not required to do? And these are personal websites, so technically they don't even fall under GDPR. But the more interesting question is what should I be doing? What's the right thing to do in this situation? So I realized we're having this discussion at Indie Webcamp Berlin, and I realized, oh yeah, I was, you know, someone posts a response to one of my blog posts, and they've marked it up in H entry. I post the whole response as a comment on my site, and I started to question, oh, was that, was that the right thing to do? I'm, I'm, in, I'm inferring just from the fact that they sent me a web mention and marked it up in H entry that they're okay with that but they never signed an agreement that they were okay with that. So I started to question this, and we started to discuss other ways of taking signals from the other site that maybe, are they okay with this or not? Is there a license on the other site, like a Creative Commons license, that's a good signal. Is there um, meta tags that indicate, you know, uh, no follow or something like that, maybe, or no index, maybe we should, you know, look at that. Is there a robots text file? And we start to realize what we're doing is basically coming up with an algorithm a fuzzy set of steps that we could follow. And now we realize, oh, well, we don't want to do what you know, Facebook and Instagram do. They've got algorithms, and they're completely hidden and secret, and they don't show them. So if we do come up with you know, ways of deciding whether or not I should publish this on my own website, I think the crucial thing will be that we're transparent about it. And we say, if you do this, then you'll, I'll publish the whole post. If you do this, I'll publish an expert, excerpt. If you do this, I'm just going to publish a link with no identifying information. So a uh, great question and exactly the kind of thing that we, we enjoy talking about. Um, just for clarification, the way it looks to me is that you're always dependent on the APIs of those wall gardens, for the API for Facebook, the API for Instagram and so on. Well, if you take this a bit further, if you think that eventually everybody could be posting these things on their own website. Mm -hmm. Isn't this breaking the, the kind of business model of those walled gardens? Yeah, I hope so, yeah. Then why should they continue on, on doing this? They're generally not. Like I said, Facebook is, is kind of cracking down and becoming much more of a roach motel. Um, Instagram doesn't allow you to post to Instagram. You can only post from. So with a lot, a lot of them now, we have to do the... Um, Pesos one, where you know, publish elsewhere and send a copy to my own website, Instagram, and now Facebook since they cracked down. Um, so yeah, I mean, it would be wonderful if we did manage to break their business models, because their business models suck. Um, but yeah, no, so it's not that I'm dependent. It's this thing, I'm not dependent on, on any of those APIs. It's just, if those APIs still support it, I'm going to send them copies. If they switch that off, they no longer get the copies. It's kind of in their interest, though, to be getting the copies. Like, I never publish on Twitter directly. I never go to twitter.com and type a tweet. I only do it from my website. So if Twitter wants to that activity on Twitter, it needs to keep that channel open and allow. I know that Twitter has been getting worse and worse with third parties being able to publish to it, but they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot there. We had another question. Great. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask, what's your opinion on blockchain te technology and taking back the web? So, um, I'm glad that you asked about blockchain and not a specific implementation like, say, Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> uh, because if anybody is, is a, a, a fan of blockchain, you should be very, very against Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is doing more than anything else to besmirch the blockchain and uh, uh, bring it down. So, if you're in favor of blockchain, please speak out against Bitcoin and its dreadful environmental impact. The blockchain is very interesting when it comes to this idea of uh, distributed networks and decentralization. Now, this isn't an area I know much about, but again, actually at Indie Web Camp Berlin, there was a really great discussion about, uh, it's not blockchain directly, I guess, but distributed um, ways of sharing URLs. And it seemed the two protocols right now that look most interesting are the Interplanetary File System, IPFS, and uh, DAT. I forget what DAT stands for, but it's the one that's underlying the Beaker browser. Uh, I'm not sure if blockchain is directly behind both of those, one of those, neither of those, but certainly the blockchain ideas of you know, distributed copies of things. So the idea being that, okay, let's, we're all in this room together and we all have devices and we're all on a network. So if you want to visit my website, why should you have to go all the way out to the the cloud, 
uh, when you know, someone here has a copy of my website. Why not just request a copy from them? So you get this peer-to-peer -peer distribution of URLs. That's very exciting, particularly for, and this was the context we were discussing it in, particularly for in contexts where people are trying to publish things in, uh, in countries where the governments are cracking down and censoring uh, personal publishing. And you know, they, can, they could block URLs, so like my, URL, my website might be blocked in China or some other country, but with these kind of technologies, um, people could still distribute. As long as one person behind the firewall has a copy, that copy can get around. Now, as I understand that the big difference between the two is um, that is really good for content that doesn't change much. Basically, a URL that's going to remain static, that kind of encodes it into a hashed version, and you can then share that around. Um, IPF, IPFS is maybe better for content that changes more often. Um, and like I said, I don't know the underlying technologies, but I believe the blockchain is under there somewhere. You know, whenever somebody says blockchain, I just do a mental substitution for lots of copies of a spreadsheet, because that's what the blockchain is. Um, but I can see how lots of copies of a spreadsheet uh, could help with uh, keeping URLs around. So yeah, IPFS and DAT are the ones to keep an eye on. And there's, there's, there's definitely a crossover with a lot of the ideas of the indie web. Uh, there. So not necessarily blockchain directly, but the technology is built on top of it, yeah. We had another question. Oh, I know one. Great question, by the way. That picture coming through. Okay. Uh, before giving my question, I wanted to comment on the on your HTML bet and URLs. Actually, I know that this January is going to be held an ICANN conference soon, and they will talk about voting on killing URLs. And also, a month ago, with the 20th anniversary of Google, they also had a new idea on replacing URLs with a new technology. They didn't give any more inf information, but I just know that they are working on a, a beta version. Well, so there's a thing, there's this web packaging uh, format they're working on where you can kind of claim to be one URL but actually be serving it from somewhere else because it's sort of all signed. And as and far as I can see, Google are doing this to combat a lot of the criticisms around AMP, the fact that AMP has to be served from you know, Google's CDN. Say, so, well, what if it could look like it's being served from your domain? Uh, the URL is your URL, but actually it's still being served from our CDN. Uh, so that's a lot of what they're, they're looking into there. Um, you read the URL, I would say, is under attack from certain sources. Um, and sometimes in the name of uh, UX, like the, starting this, this myth that, oh, URLs are horrible. URLs are such a terrible user experience, so let's, let's hide them away. And this gets to a bigger question of uh, empowerment. Um, in a certain sense, URLs are you know, showing the seams. They're showing the, uh, the, the, the technologies, showing the plumbing of the web. And you're right that you know, users probably shouldn't have to worry about the plumbing, right? Users don't need to know HTML or CSS or JavaScript to use the web. Why should they have to know what a URL is? And no, they shouldn't, right? URLs are exposing the plumbing. And there's this idea, we talk about seamless design. We talk about hiding the seams to make for a better user experience. But every time you do that, you're also taking away some power. Because if you do understand URLs, you can use that. If you do understand HTML, you can view source. View source is also under attack. So in the name of good user experience, we're maybe disempowering users. And we, we look to science fiction for a lot of our dystopias and worst case scenarios, right? And there's various futures we could look to that look terrible. One that worries me the most is the one that's depicted in, in Pixar's film Wall-E. And I don't mean the environmental dystopia of planet Earth. I mean the, on the spaceship. The people who have every need taken care of seamlessly, right? And they don't have to think. That's the watchword of good user experience, right? Don't make me think. And yet in the world of security, the whole point is that you need to be watchful. You need to be mindful. Do make me think. Make me aware. So there's always this tension, I feel, between power and ease of use. And in the name of ease of use, we may end up taking away the power. It was um, Marshall McLuhan, I think, who said that every augmentation is also an amputation. You know, it's great that we have uh, mobile phones that guide us around, but are we the last generation to ever get lost, right? Are we losing the skill to 
memorize phone numbers, not a great skill, I will admit, but you get the idea that in, by making things easier, we, we, we also lose something. And the URL is an example where I can totally see how we'd be making life easier by obfuscating URLs, but we would also be taking away a certain amount of power from the end user. And I'm certainly going to be fighting to keep URLs. And as my second and last question, uh, I was driven up, uh, from the beginning of your presentation with economics and monopoly and stuff. So what do you think? Is it really the time to have a, a, a kind of official regulation for the internet? I mean, the, there is something called multi-stakeholder multi approach and uh, internet governance that has at least from 2005 and it's been running, that you have four piles, you have the technical community, you have the government, you have the private sector and also the, the community, that they work with each other on equal footing and trying to find solutions uh, on regulating the internet and also fight against fragmentation because you have now GDPR in Europe but it's not the same in US or in Africa or Asia. So do you think that it is the time to have an unfragmented cyberspace? Um, this is a tricky one. I'm not going to touch it with a barge pole, but um, I would say a lot of the issues are more about just enforcing uh, existing laws that would apply to things if they weren't on the internet. So right now you have companies doing things that if they were a bricks and mortar store, they wouldn't be able to do, but for some reason because they're on the internet, uh, they're, they're getting away scot-free with, with practices that, you know, for some reason just because it's software, the regular laws don't apply. So whether the governance is coming from governments, whereas it's coming from bodies like ICANN or anyone else, I don't really have an opinion on that. I think it's more that we need to stop treating the internet and the real world as though they're two separate things and just um, apl apply the same rules we would apply anywhere else. Now, you're absolutely right that then messy things like borders and countries and uh, differing regulations come into that uh, and it's messy. I don't really have an answer to that. That's, uh, that's definitely a tricky one. Uh, I, I do wonder, you know, look, you know, the time we're in where I can have my own website and publish it. And I don't have to ask anyone for permission. I can do what I like. It's my own playground. I do what I want. Like, in future, will we look back at this as some kind of like, oh, remember when we used to be able to do that? Wasn't that great? Or will it be like, oh, this was just the beginning? You know, this, in the future, this will be the norm. And why would we ever have wanted you know, to be publishing in a centralized place like Facebook or Twitter when we could have all been doing this all along. Um, I don't know which future it's going to be. Um, it's hard to see. Okay, thank you very much, Jeremy.